they can ask even as adults. Is there anything special for Damien? Sometimes that's your spouse. In our Sunday gathering, we often announce next Sunday will be a communion Sunday. Or I will stand up and say, and now we will proceed to the next part of our worship, the Lord's Supper. When you hear those words, what do you usually think about? Ano po ang iniisip mo pag narinig mo ng asan ka sa inyo? A communion pala. When you hear those words, what do you usually think about? What do you feel? As Christians, do you ask, is there anything special for supper? Regarding the Lord's Supper? Do you just go with the flow since it's part of our Christian tradition? Or what is the Lord's Supper really to you? Is it really essential? Why do we need to incorporate it into our worship service? Remember the following. First, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper to his disciples in the upper room before his arrest. Remember that? Second, the disciples passed it on, the disciples passed it on to the early converts to Christianity. Number three, in effect, the churches observed, observed the Lord's Supper as part of their Christian faith. It was important to Jesus, it was important to the disciples of Jesus, and it was important to the church of Jesus Christ. How did they do the Lord's Supper? How did they observe the Lord's Supper? In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, Christians continuously devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. Which, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 46, with one accord, breaking bread from house to house. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, they do so on the first day of the week. Which is? What's the first day of the week? It is Sunday. Notice the pattern done in the early church. The Lord's Supper was done continuously. The Lord's Supper was done in a place where the gathered congregation worship, and the Lord's Supper was done on the first day of the week. That's the pattern of the early church. Ah, are, are we good? Okay, continue tayo. Now, the Lord's Supper was important to Jesus, his apostles, and the Church of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper isn't a snack, okay? Hindi po niya ang Lord's Supper during the worship service. Ay nang may kababayan siya. Luis-luis na namin. We don't say merienda. We say minandan. Minandan. The Lord's Supper, the communion, is not in minandan during the worship service. It's not a snack. The Lord's Supper isn't a snack on a Sunday worship gathering. The Lord's Supper is vital in our growth and maturity in the faith. And therefore, we must take the Lord's Supper seriously. Okay? So, what must we do? What must we, what must we to know as we take the Lord's Supper seriously? Let's begin with the first point. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of Christian unity. Everybody say unity. One more time. Unity. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of Christian unity. When Christians participate in the Lord's Supper together, it gives a clear sign of their unity with one another. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, Since there is one bread, we, we who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Many parts, one body. We all partake of the one bread. When we come together at the table of the Lord and eat 
the bread, we show the unity we have with all other believers who also partake, participate in the Lord's Supper. Unfortunately, this was violated. The purpose of the Lord's Supper was violated in the Corinthian church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. Read. Read it with me. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you. Because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Ooh. What are you? For, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that division exists among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Verse 20. Therefore, when you meet together in the same place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. In Tagalog, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. For do you not have the, for do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In vain I will not praise you. The church at Corinth was, com was composed of believers with various social statuses. There were wealthy members, there were the middle class, and there were slaves. Like earliest churches, they met in private houses for their gatherings, which of course included eating. Okay? No doubt, after every meal, they will commemorate the Lord's Supper. But, Paul heard that the church in Corinth was divided, was divided in those gatherings, bringing more harm than good, thus despising the Lord's church, thus despising the Lord's Supper. What happened? The wealthy members of the church will come first bring good food and drinks. They will eat and drink and will become full and drunk even before the lower class members arrive. So, in their gatherings, some members were full and drunk and some were hungry. Division in the church of Corinth. That was their attitude. They were selfish. They were, they were not united. That was their attitude towards other believers. Yet, they all partake in the Lord's Supper. How shameful. This reminds me of a Facebook post I always see. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, Daniel, again. The Kissy Lab. The global league in English and silence have the advantage of each other, but slandering one another. I believe this is true. Oh, the Christian and the global banding have the advantage of each other, but slandering one another. Everybody say, filthy. <laughs> or filthy, no. No, it's not just the stick of Filipino. Uh, it's the virus in all people, in all groups of people, and it's infecting the church of Christ. And it happened in the church of the church at Corinth. How about this? Taking the Lord's Supper, but slandering another believer. If that is true outside the church, it is it can be true inside the church. I remember the Lord's Supper is a sacrament that 
so demonstrate the unity of the church. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament that so demonstrates the unity of the church. One in which we said, and I will quote, the Lord's Supper is a, is a, is a family need and God desires that his children love one another. It is impossible for a, a true Christian to get closer to his Lord while at the same time he is separated from his fellow believers, of course. We are God's family. We are one family. And every time we take the bread and the wine, we must demonstrate and practice Christian unity, Christian love. As the early Christians gathered in small groups, surely they used a single loaf, a single bread loaf, and a common cup to commemorate the Lord's Supper. This symbolizes Christian unity. We eat from one loaf and drink of one cup. We are united together both in Christ and because of Christ. This is the basis of Christian unity. We are together, we are united together in the name of Christ and because of Christ. That's it. The, our unity shouldn't be dependent on music. Some people want some people love games. Some people love John Bowen. Some people love Elevation in Houston and Planet Center. Or there are the elites who love Israel Newton. I belong to that one. <laughs> and to the other one. The first one I mentioned, him. Some people love formal worship. Some people love not that formal worship. Friends, remember this. Our unity is dependent on the name of Jesus Christ and what Christ has done for us. It is the gospel. Friends, it's possible that today you are not on good terms with other believers. Perhaps you are holding a grudge against a brother or a sister. Maybe you hold resentment with a believer. Or you are irritated or jealous, or not forgiving. Remember what Sinclair Ferguson said, quote, One of the real signs that we have experienced everything Christ offers us at the table, at the Lord's table, is that when we rise from it, we want to love the, the fellow Christians who surround us and be reconciled to any of them from whom we may have become estranged. In this way, the Lord's Supper, what? Melt our hearts, encourages us to forgive others, and create a wonderful, fresh spirit of fellowship and hope. The scripture is encouraging every believer to use the Lord's Supper to fix every relationship with other fellow believers. Let's use the time to be reconciled. Let's use the bread and the wine to renew our love to one another. The Lord's Supper invites all to be humble before God and other believers. Second point, the Lord's Supper provides an opportunity to remember. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 25, we read, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in, in, the night in which he was being betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, What did he say? This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In this verse, the command to us is to remember.
remember. Remember. To be honest, I have a question. To be honest, who among you admit being forgetful? Sino po ang forgetful? Mga kalimutin. Please raise your hand. Higher, higher. Wow. This is a, ano, uh, amnesia? Dementia? Alzheimer. <laughs> We all, we are all guilty of being forgetful. We have a Tagalog saying, Ang paalala ay gamot sa taong nakakalimot. Or in English, a reminder is medicine for the person who forgets. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a medicine for forgetful Christians. How often do we, we observe the Lord's Supper? How often? Huh? How often? Once a month. So at least once a month, we have a reminder of what the Lord has done on our behalf. That's the point. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he was giving us an ongoing sacrament in the Christian church to remind us to remember him because we are prone to forget and be distracted by so many things like, you know, we are easily distracted by so many things such as the why of the wow, the MOG fellowship and Bible study. The, the LCC meeting after the service. The church anniversary that is coming up. The defeated church fund. The song line up and the worship team schedule. The setting up of everything in the church at 8 a.m. And on and on. And on this road. We are easily distracted by so many good things. Those things are important, but never misunderstanding. Sometimes we forget what Christ did to us on the cross due to all the other church concerns and the concerns of life. Sometimes nakakalimutan natin yung ginawa ng Diyos sa ating buhay dahil sa sobrang daming alalahanin na sa buhay. So what are we supposed to remember? Remember, right? We've had our sins forgiven. Jesus bore our sin in His own body on the cross. It is our sin, but He bore our sins on the cross. In Christ, we are accepted into the family of God. And Jesus loves us no matter how we say and how unfaithful we are. And there are so many things to, be, to, to remember. To partake the Lord's Supper and ignore to remember Him is not the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper invites us to remember everything Jesus has done. The Lord's Supper is an invitation for us to remember again and again and again and again. The things that we should do, that we should, we should have done, but Jesus did on our behalf. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, took cup, saying, Do this in remembrance of me. Number two, the Lord's Supper is a time to proclaim the Lord's death. Verse 26 For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim. You proclaim the death of the Lord until He comes. It is remarkable that Jesus wanted His followers to remember His death. Most people don't want to remember the death of their loved ones. That's understandable. But here, Jesus is telling us the importance of His death. Because everything we have as Christians depends on that. His death. The wine in the Lord's Supper represents what? What? 
the blood. The wine of the Lord's Supper represents the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Remember this, blood is one substance that the human body depends upon for life. That is why there are religious groups who forbid eating blood because it's life. Understand the word? It, it is written in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, all things are clean. According to the book of Mark, Mark, not Mark. According to the book of Mark, remember, if you are following the Bible reading uh, challenge, blood is one substance that the human body depends upon life. That's why if you lose a considerable amount of blood, you will, what will happen? Die. Let's read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Yes, shedding blood is necessary for you and I to be forgiven. When Christ shed his blood on the cross, his physical body died. This reality must remind each of us that forgiveness is not cheap, but costly. That's life. Forgiveness is not cheap, but costly. The forgiveness we have in Christ it's not just, okay, I am forgiving you, no? He died on the cross to shed his blood so that we will be cleansed, so that we will be forgiven. In the Lord's Supper, when the bread is broken, diba? one bread, uh, one thousand, the broke in the bread, it symbolizes the breaking of Christ's body. When the cup is poured out, it symbolizes the pouring of Christ's blood for us. Is it just a snack? No? In this manner, we proclaim the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus commanded his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. This is one of the reasons why outsiders think that Christians were cannibals. In the early days, when Christianity was still new, people think, outsiders think that Christians were cannibals because they eat the body of Christ and drink the blood. But what does it mean? As we individually reach out and take the cup for ourselves, we eat, each and every one of us say, I am taking the benefit of Christ's death to myself. Every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, drink of the cup, we say, I am taking the benefit of Christ's death to myself. When we do this, we give a symbol of the fact that we participate in the benefits earned for us by the death of Christ. In this manner, whenever we partake in the Lord's Supper, we look back, we look back to the past, making the sins of Golgotha fresh in our heart and mind. Nobody should forget Golgotha. Nobody should forget the cross of Jesus Christ. Nobody should forget the old rugged cross. It must be fresh, always fresh in our heart and in our mind. In the Lord's Supper, we remind ourselves that Jesus died so we could live. And not just live, but live forever. Live eternally. He died so that we could live. Next point. The Lord's Supper is a time to anticipate the Lord's coming. 
the Lord is coming. Let us read it again. For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death, the death of the Lord, until, until we come. We observe the Lord's Supper until He comes. This implies that this sacrament of the Lord's Supper is not permanent. Okay? Are you excited about that? It's not permanent. It will not last forever. There will come a day when we, as Christians, as the Church of Jesus Christ, will no longer need to say observe the Lord's Supper. Let me give you the reason why. Every time we partake in the Lord's Supper, we look not only to the past, referring to Christ's death, but also to the future, referring to His second coming. When He comes, He will bring His church, He will take His church into His presence. And there, we will be married and have fellowship with Him forever. Kaya pag hindi na ako pinasal, my last, my last chance is to be married to Christ. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Let me take you to the first Lord's Supper. Let me take you to the Lord's first Supper. Um, to the first Lord's Supper. And notice Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. Jesus said, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus says, Last Supper with His disciples, ang kasawid na tayo, will be followed by this one. And we're still waiting and anticipating this final day. Are you excited about that? That the Lord's Supper is not permanent? That there will come a day that we will dine with Him. After drinking of, from the cup of wine, Jesus said, I will no longer drink of the wine from now until when? Until that day when he will drink it with us in the, in the kingdom of heaven. Friends, Jesus' desire has been dining with the people he loved the most. Huh? And the next time he will drink and dine with his people will be in this event. What event? Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. When he, and then he said to me, Right? Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Friends, remember this. In this life, all you need to do is to make sure that you are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited. And who are those? Believers. Those who genuinely accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Those who have Christ in their heart and in their life. Who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Those who follow Jesus Christ. So if you want to know if you are invited, <laughs> I remember one, I remember our term in Louisiana. Kumbida. Dapat ikaw ay kumbidado. Sa iba ay invitado. Sa amin ay kumbida. Dapat ikaw ay kumbida. Are you invited? Are you invited? I hope. And if you are 
are still not sure if you are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, make sure that you make that commitment today. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you are already sure, how about your spouse? How about your children? How about your friends? How about your relatives? Are they invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? We have a mission to do. Amen? We have a mission to do. So, the time will come when the Lord's Supper will be over. We will no longer sin in heaven. Everything will become new and perfect in heaven. And we will eat supper with Him forever. But while we're waiting, the Lord's Supper must be a constant reminder to be faithful. To be faithful. To be faithful until the day of Jesus' return. Will you please turn to the person beside you and ask them, Are you faithful? Huh? Please don't talk to yourself. Please ask the person beside you or the one who you can remember. Are you faithful? <laughs> Faithful. Okay. Done. Next. Next point. The Lord's Supper is a regular opportunity for self-examination. Hmm. Why? We usually don't examine ourselves. <laughs> we usually don't examine ourselves. We spend examining other people's lives. Amen. What's wrong? Problem? The Lord's Supper is a regular opportunity for self-examination. We usually don't examine ourselves. Am I living a holy life? Am I living in a manner consistent with the gospel? Is my relationship with God and with other members of the church right? If, in the previous point, the Lord's Supper takes our attention to the past and the future events. Now, in this point, the Lord's Supper takes our focus within ourselves. First Corinthians chapter 11, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in much in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty. Shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Paul did not say that we must be worthy to partake in the Lord's Supper. If it is so, nobody can come and participate. Come on. If we're talking about people, deserving people, then nobody can participate in the Lord's Supper. Nobody can partake because nobody is deserving. Nobody is worthy. So, sorry. Can you please just my my bottle of water will be inside my inside my bag. Thank you. Paul did not say that we must be worthy in the Lord's supper. Thank you. It is so, nobody can come and participate. At the communion service in Scotland, you know, the former principal, at the communion service in Scotland, the pastor noted a woman in the congregation did not accept the bread and the cup from the elder, but instead sat weeping. The pastor left the Lord's table and went to her and said, Sister, take me. He eats, my dear, he eats for sinners. He eats for sinners. Indeed, the Lord's Supper is for sinners, but broken sinners, broken by their own sinfulness. That's the manner acceptable in the Lord's table. You must be broken by your own sin. 
an unworthy manner is going to the Lord's table and actually God my sin. I still enjoy my sin and I'm still proud of my sin. Those are unworthy manners. The Lord suffered is for sinners, broken by their own sinfulness. That's why that pastor had a communion service in Scotland. Even the weeping woman, sister, take and eat. This is for sinners. Paul's reference to worthiness is not too short. But the manner in approaching the Lord's Supper is different. Who is expecting? If we are to participate in a worthy manner, remember these three things. First, examine. Second, judge. Third, confess. First, examine your own heart. Your own. Luganyun. You circle that word, your own heart. You may, you know, too many Christians, when they go to church with the detective's eyes, watching other people's sin, but fail to acknowledge their own sin. Second, judge your own sins. Judge your own sins and not the sins of others. If we will not judge our own sins, God is the one to judge us and discipline us. We will read that in the following passage, in the following verse. If you don't judge your own sin, God will judge you. Third, confess your sins to the Lord. To partake in the Lord's Supper with unconfessed sins is to be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Remember that our sins were the reason the Lord was made on the cross. So you don't come to the table with a pride, with a crown, with um, pride. You don't come to the table saying, I'm proud of my sins, I'm happy doing my sins, and I enjoy doing my sins. Remember that our sins were the reason the Lord was made on the cross. So, to partake in the Lord's Supper, one must set their own motives and resolve to make them right before God and others. We are all sinners before. Even be nagkasala before going to church. So nobody, so nobody was protected. Tama? The Lord's Supper is inviting each and every one of us to make our heart right before God. This is a reminder to us. Lord, make me clean. Lord, forgive me. And Lord, One in which we said in a quote, no one ought to come to the table if his heart is not right with God and his fellow Christians. Why fellow Christians? Remember the first point. It is a symbol of Christian unity. I am going, the Lord's Supper must, be, must lead you to fix your own heart before God. The Lord's Supper must remind you of the holiness of God. The Lord's Supper must remind you to deal with the remaining sins you have in your heart. The Lord's Supper must lead you to repent of your sins and realign your lifestyle to the holiness and righteousness of God. And the Lord's Supper must remind you that as soon as you confess and ask for forgiveness, you can boldly, confidently come, for you are accepted before God. Last point. The Lord's Supper is dangerous if you take it lightly. I want you to join me as I read. First Corinthians 11, 28 to 29. Everybody, one, two, three, begin. But a man must test himself, and so do we eat, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. If he does not judge the body rightly, verse 13, for this reason, the 
Hello. According to this passage, one of the reasons why there were members at the Corinthian church were weak, sick, and dead was their ignorance of reflecting on themselves before taking the Lord's Christ. Have you heard this one? Is this new to you? I hope not, because I've been reading this for three years. I've been reading for three years and ever for three years. The Lord's Supper is not a snack in the worship gathering. The Lord's Supper is not merely eating the bread and drinking the wine. The Lord's Supper is so sacred that when people take it lightly, God is moved to chastise the offender. There is a serious consequence to an abuse of the Lord's Supper. And what happened to many of the Corinthian Christians must be a reminder to all of us to treat the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, with high respect since the Lord is present. Remember this, huh? The Lord is present in the sacrament. Let me clear this point a bit further. When Paul says the Lord will judge the people who come to the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, he doesn't mean the Lord will send them to eternal judgment. Ibang judgment. That's another. It is a different kind of judgment. Okay? This judgment that Paul refers to is God's discipline or chastisement to his people. First Corinthians 11, 31. Everybody, read. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. See the difference? If the Lord disciplines you for disrespecting the Lord's Supper, remember that it is for your own good. He is chastising you to spare you from the final judgment that the unbelievers will receive. In the last part. So that we will not be condemned along with the world because the world is already condemned. When we fail to treat the Lord's Supper properly, God will act as our heavenly Father who punishes His disobedient children. I am Lord, remember, when you partake in the Lord's Supper, you are participating in a holy sacrament meant to make you take your Christian life seriously. Everything we do in our worship service, everything we do in our Christian life must be taken seriously. So, as the worship team is setting up, and as the uh, elders are preparing for our Lord's Supper, conclusion. As I am, let me pick up my question in the introduction. Is there anything special for supper, referring to the Lord's Supper? And the answer is yes. Yes, it is special. Because the Lord is. The Lord's Supper is not a snack. We take every first Sunday on the month. The Lord's Supper is not a joke to be taken lightly because Jesus is present in the element. We are taking his body and blood into our body, into our own body, and making him part of our life. So never forget, when we come to the table of the Lord, check your relationship. With one another. Cherish the cross of Jesus Christ. Correct your motive for partaking in the sacrament. The Lord's Supper is not a requirement to be saved. Okay? The Lord's Supper is not a requirement to be saved. The Lord's Supper is the sacrament in which all who are saved are invited to dine. 
who ate with the Lord is spiritually speaking. So, for those who are for those who are already saved, take your motive. For those who are still not sure of their eternal life, am I forgiven? Do I have eternal life? Am I invited to the Lord's supper, to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Do I have Jesus Christ in my life? Friends, live in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Receive the free offer of salvation. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have an everlasting life. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. To be accept, accept the free offer of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Everyone, everyone, please stand.